Hi folks, this is your host Eric Fleischman. I want to begin this episode with an apology. In the very first episode of the Orange that I hosted, I interviewed Andrew Kemley on his article Libertarianism vs. Psychopathic Dumbfuckery, in which he criticizes the destructive pandemic policies of so-called libertarian politicians, like Rand Paul, as being similar to psychopathy. It was soon after pointed out to both me and Andrew by folks both in and outside of C4SS, that this kind of language is deeply stigmatizing towards people living with psychopathy and other antisocial personality disorders, and is therefore inherently ableist in general. These criticisms are 100% correct, and I want to apologize from the bottom of my heart for not just using that language, but embracing it so enthusiastically and wantonly. Andrew has also written an apology that can be found on the C4SS website titled An Apology to the Neurodivergent Community. From myself, um, I want to say that I really have no excuses for this behavior, particularly as someone who is neurodivergent and suffers from mental health problems. I should have known better. In addition to removing the episode from public listing, while leaving it accessible so as to not try and erase our mistake, I want to promise to both our audience and the broader neurodivergent community that going forward as the host of the Enrange, I will be more responsible and inclusive with my language. Finally, I want to echo the point made by Max Crow that, quote, in order to be an anarchist, you must be not just anti-racist, not just anti-sexist, but also be anti-ableist, to include everyone who's part of the struggle. Thank you to everyone who has helped hold us accountable and I hope you can enjoy this latest episode. This is The Enrage, a show where we take a deeper dive into written works published at the Center for a Stateless Society. Join us as we give voice to the ideas challenging the vain phantoms that haunt our social reality and stand in the way of total liberation. For more information, visit c4ss.org. And to support this show or any of the other projects happening at the center, please visit patreon.com slash c4ss.org. Thank you for listening. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the 17th installment of the Enrange. This is your new host, Eric Fleischman. Today we'll be joined by Aaron Koek to discuss their article, The Social Ecology of Egoism, which is a part of Center for Stateless Society's Mutual Exchange Symposium on Anarchism and Egoism. Aaron Koek is a blog writer who discusses the historical, political, philosophical, and social aspects within anarchism. They have been writing since 2014 and hope to contribute to the wider discussion and activity of anarchist theory and practice. Aaron, welcome to the RLJ. Hello. How are you? How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I uh, I planted some tomatoes and squash uh, earlier today. Oh, that's, Feeling that's good. good. That's good to hear. I planted some corn myself earlier, or rather a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Well, it sounds like we're both having very productive summers then. Yeah. Um, so to kind of begin, uh, how did you hear about the Mutual Exchange Symposium? And are there any pieces in it that really stand out to you? Yeah, I, I basically heard about the symposium just through working with the C4SS. Um, once they post about the symposium and were asking for pieces, it kind of piqued my interest. So... I decided to, uh, mm. to to send in a piece. Fantastic. And um, in regards to uh, pieces that really stood out to me, there were definitely two. Uh, the first one was uh, Saul Newman's Insurrectional Revolution, as well as Evan Pierce's uh, The Echo and Our Home. Yeah, I was also very excited by the by the Saul Newman piece, particularly just because Saul Newman is a pretty prolific anarchist writer and a uh, have him on uh, the center is pretty awesome. Um, so, uh, so to getting to your piece, uh, 
Can you please give our listeners a brief synopsis and a glimpse at some of the inspiration behind it? Yeah, sure. So I've been interested in both social ecology and egoism for quite a while now. And I've been reading both theoretically. And over the course of that, I've kind of noticed some things between the two theories that I personally feel kind of click and work well with one another. So that was kind of the overall inspiration for this piece, as well as within the discourse of anarchism, there's kind of this individualism versus individual versus social uh, kind of debate. And I personally don't really care for that. And in part, this is kind of my way to kind of try to start stepping beyond that argument and that debate. Yeah, uh, and we'll definitely touch upon that tension between individualism and communitarianism. But to begin, uh, you define this all in your article, but for the uninitiated, what is egoism and what is social ecology? And could you provide some definitions of the terms within social ecology like first nature, second nature, free nature? Yeah, sure. So I'll start with egoism. So egoism is kind of the term that's given broadly to Max Stirner's philosophy as well as others. I don't want to pigeonhole egoism. It's very much a very broad philosophical current, but it at its core kind of started with Max Stirner and his philosophy or his ideas. If I were to kind of distill them down to a very basic idea, it would be the relationship of people and their alienation from their property. And property is kind of broadly defined, at least to myself and my understanding of his work in two ways which is something that is owned as well as something that is a quality or attribute. So to give a very basic example of that, so my hand. My hand is a property in the sense that it's a quality or attribute. It's a part of me. It's also my property in the sense that I have power over it and I can do what I want with it. So that's kind of a very basic definition of egoism. And... So, so social ecology is a philosophy that was uh, founded by Murray Bookchin as well as their associate, Dan Chortikoff. And the basic idea is that our ecological problems stem from human social problems. And within that idea is the idea of first nature and second nature. So first nature is what we would typically think of as nature, like plants, birds, trees, uh, fish, bugs, all that good stuff. Uh, Second nature would be within the human social realm. So uh, the way that we associate with one another, our governments, our economy, our ideas, our language. And social ecology kind of says that there's this to put it simply, kind of a schism between first and second nature. And the idea is to move towards what Bookchin defines as a free nature, which is when first and second nature are are able to kind of coexist again. So that's the kind of ecological realm existing with the human social realm. So that's kind of a basic rundown of those two ideas, at least to me. And however, you know, and you must, you know this, many people would argue that egoism and communalism, which is the political program of Murray Bookchin, are antithetical. Um, and I see a definite tension in your article between, as I said before, communitarianism and radical individualism. Uh, could you talk on how you resolve that tension and what sort of political program emerges from such a resolution? Yeah, I am very accepting of that tension because it's, it definitely exists. And some people might take issue with my kind of blending of egoism with social ecology. I, I haven't personally met anybody yet who's said that, but they, they might be out there. Um, so, so the way that I kind of address the tension is, 
within Bookchin's philosophy, it very much is a social philosophy. Like, there's no doubt about that. But he doesn't ignore discussions or the importance of the individual. And that's kind of where I started to bridge this gap between Stirner and uh, Bookchin's philosophies in that, you know, Bookchin understood that in order for us to have, you know, for society to interact with first nature, we first have to start with individual people because society is made up of individual people. So from that, I was able to kind of take Sterner's ideas of the self and kind of start to see similarities between the two. And to kind of go into that a little more. So in regards to the tension between Sterner and Bookchin, I kind of almost completely embrace it because you know, there's always going to be, even in reality, tension between individuals and their society. That's just always going to be a thing. There's, I don't think there's a quote unquote resolution to that as there's always going to be individual people and then the associations of those individual people. And then there's always going to be tension. And to me, kind of accepting that is a good place to start because it kind of steps beyond this idea of, oh, we got to focus on the individual or, oh, we got to focus on the social end of it when really it's both and they're different, but also relational. So when I start, when I think about Sterner's philosophy, it kind of emphasizes this importance of the individual and his relationship to their property. Mm -hmm. And me as a human being on earth require air, water, and certain nutrients and proteins and whatnot in order to survive. I am not entirely 100% autonomous. I cannot exist on my own. So I have to accept that. When I accept that, I then have to see the importance of how I get those things. And how I get those things is through the planet and the biosphere and the ecology around me. And the way that capitalism functions is it very much is in a, it's, it's based within accumulation. So through that accumulation of property, that being, you know, in this case, it's very much a things to be owned kind of thing in that through the state, individual people and corporations are able to own property that they themselves probably never interact with. You know, a corporation can own thousands of miles of land and they may have only even seen like 1% of it because, you know, they go to the office that their company owns and that's about it. So Mm -hmm. when we extend that to the idea of ecology, there are a lot of corporations that are very, and I would argue all corporations, in, in a sense, are very destructive for the environment in that they don't really consider the biodiversity of it and more. So for a very specific example, monocrop farming is probably the most talked about example of this, where entire ecosystems will basically be devastated to grow one crop. And for the biological stability of the environment, it's not great because what we know about biodiversity is that biodiversity is kind of the bedrock of survival on the planet. So to compare like the Amazon to like a desert. So the Amazon has thousands upon thousands of different life ways existing within its space. And, you know, granted, we don't want to see those destroyed because it's the Amazon is very important to our ecology, but it takes a lot more to destroy the balance of the Amazon because of how many life ways are in it than it would say to destroy something like the desert. Because while the desert isn't lifeless, that's kind of a misconception. Um, 
it has a lot less life, so it's a lot more unstable in that sense. So what we kind of draw from that is that diversity creates stability. And for society, that can be a very useful social principle, not out of a sense of morality, but just because it's we see the functionality of it within nature. And we can also see just kind of throughout human history, the functionality of, of diversity of responses and peoples, basically the advantage that diversity has for us as a mm. society. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and you just spoke on this a little bit about the relationship of the individual to nature, to the biosphere. Uh, you write in your article, quote, we must protect the biosphere as an extension of ourselves, which is only possible through our direct power to affect a meaningful relationship with the biosphere. This is a way broader definition of selfhood than is found in like classical liberalism and North American libertarianism. Can you elaborate on this broader ecological self uh, and maybe how it relates to Stirner's original ideas of the ego, the unique, the self? Yeah, sure. So, like you said, it, it is a much broader definition in that it kind of encompasses the broadness of ecology in that we are very much a part of our planet and its life ways and how it functions. So how that relates to Sterner's philosophy, as I kind of said a little bit earlier, but obviously I'll elaborate more now here, it kind of starts with the idea that, you know, I am a part of my planet. I require it to survive. So I am invested in it as a part of myself, because in that sense, it is a part of myself. Because I draw sustenance from it. I breathe the air that's part of the planet. I drink its water. So I want to make sure that that ecological environment continues to not only be stable, but continues to thrive. Because if it doesn't, that puts my own life at risk. And outside of, you know, the natural conclusions of death that are out of my control, I prefer not to die. So I'd like to see the ecology of the planet continue to exist and thrive. So to me, that means kind of seizing back what I would consider to be an extension of myself, my property, which is my local ecology. It's a part of myself. You know, I don't want to see it polluted. I'd like to breathe, you know, clean air. Yeah, no, completely understandable. I also enjoy breathing clean air and i <laughs> and i um it's you know it's definitely interesting to see the sort of extension of quote unquote self interest as being much broader than like it might be defined under capitalism um and you're not the only writer to uh talk about um ecology and its relationship with the self uh, in our e anarchism and egoism mutual exchange symposium Evan Pierce, whose piece you actually mentioned earlier, The Eco in Our Home, uh, writes that, quote, his aim is to outline our inextricable interconnectedness with our environment and to explore some of the implications. If one seeks to think of oneself accurately, then one should carefully consider how one relates to the physical reality we inhabit. Is this a similar point to what you're arguing for in your piece? I would say, yeah, we came to very similar conclusions. Like, I read their piece, and by the end of it, I basically was of the mind that, yeah, well, we used essentially, diff essentially different language because we're obviously different people, so we're not going to speak the same. But what I, if, if I understood them correctly, I think we more or less came to the same conclusion, so I don't think we had a lot to disagree about there. Yeah, I, I agree with them. <laughs> yeah, it's been really interesting, the diversity of the Mutual Exchange Symposium, seeing like the different things pop up. There's been a whole line of, of, of response pieces about egoism and Christianity. And that's, I think that's super interesting. Uh, for this interview, I actually went back and I looked at some of the writing on your blog and was intrigued by your piece, Anarchy, Ecology, and Animals. Uh, in this, you write that, quote, our relationship with animals has evolved into one based on their exploitation as commodities, 
resources to be consumed by humanity for their own gains and pleasure. Because of this, you call for animal liberation and, quote, a society that not, does not need to base itself on the consumption, exploitation, and domination of animals. Uh, that all sounds great to me, but I am curious as to where animals sit in your philosophy of egoist social ecology. Uh, it wouldn't seem from what you I've read and what you said that animals are just property as extensions of human selves, but are animals then unique egos like humans? How should we see and relate to animals? Yeah, so I would say that my relationship with veganism and animal liberation is probably a little older than my relationship with egoism, which was interesting exploring the ways that those kind of related to each other. And I kind of mm-hmm. came to my own conclusion that, so obviously humans are omnivorous. We just know that about humans. We can eat both meat and plant life. But to me, what it comes down to is I am in a position as a human being within the society that I live in where I can make the active choice to not consume animals, both for my own health as well as ecological health. So while I have the full ability to consume animals I don't really want to. And I do, obviously, within that piece, kind of go into a lot more of the details of kind of like why I don't personally uh, believe in, in commodifying animals. But to kind of circle back to what you were saying about like, do we treat animals kind of as their own eagles, I, as their own egos? I would say, yeah, I would say yes. Um and I don't think that contradicts the concept of seeing animals as a property in the sense that they're an extension of us. Cause like there's kind of this idea with Max Stirner where we kind of own our relationships and that they're, they're our relationships. You know, my friendship with my friend is my friendship and they would agree that's their friendship as well. And we would both collectively describe that as our friendship. So I can have a similar relationship with the animals around me. And many people, without even thinking about it, do with their pets. You know, they they have, you know, they see it as their relationship with their pet. And, you know, depend, assuming it's a good relationship, their pet generally shows affection in such a way. It's pretty easy to say they, they more or less see it the same way. Mm-hmm. So I think there is room there for respecting kind of the quote unquote ego of animals while also ign- fully acknowledging that while humans are capable of animal consumption, I don't think it's very beneficial. And I would even argue it has a negative impact on ourselves and our uh, wider ecological environment. So would you even say that like veganism is an extension of egoism in the sense that not only are you doing it for your self-interest for like preserving the environment, but that you're also respecting the the uniqueness and individuality of animals yeah i would say so because it goes back to the concept and the importance of biodiversity really which is that all animals and plant life bring something incredibly unique to the table and all of this uniqueness that may look chaotic on the surface really has is really the establishment of millions of years of 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 biological and evolutionary balance so, yeah, I would, I would definitely, yeah. That's pretty interesting. That's, that's definitely one of the more interesting takes on, on, um, animal relationships, particularly around consumption that I've heard. And the way that you identify property is like not as negative as many people like under capitalism, like don't treat things like property, don't property corrupts things. Um, Because you endorse a combined definition, like you said before, of A, something that is owned, and B, a quality or attribute. And a lot of these things you've talked about, like your hand or even like animals, are something that, you know, are not super controversial in terms of, of like property ownership. But in reference to the first definition, something that is owned, there are a lot of standards, a lot of different standards of ownership for many different things. When it comes to land, there's Lockean labor mixing, Georgia's land rent, mutualist occupancy, occupancy and use. Um, 
within the realm of the means of production, there's the worker versus boss ownership uh, that differentiates socialism and capitalism. You condemn pr- private property, but how are different differing standards of ownership approached within egoist social ecology? So in regards to questions like this, like how I see different property relations associating with each other, I probably have what some people might consider to be somewhat of a disappointing answer, which is that I try to specifically avoid being overly prescriptive in my theoretical, uh, in my theory. So when I think about things like how different property relations might interconnect, to me, it really comes down to how actual people within those relationships will interact with each other and associate with each other and the knowledge that they have. So to me, it really comes down to, I don't know, uh, I would have to actually see people with those differing opinions interacting within real time in front of me. So it's kind of, I feel that as an anarchist, my purpose is to kind of put ideas out there and to let people kind of take them in and come to their own conclusions and make their own actions. So when it comes to questions about like, how would, you know, this political theory, how would these anarchists interact with these anarchists or, you know, this property theory interact with this property theory. I just feel that can very easily get into kind of a spiral of creating different kind of ideas within our, we could come up with a million different theoretical propositions and we can also set those up in a million different ways to get whatever answers we want. So to me, it's more important to just actively try to put our theoretical knowledge into practice and kind of test it. So to me, that's the way we answer that question. We actively try to do those kinds of relationships and see what happens. I don't think that's a disappointing answer at all. I think, I think that's, that's really kind of one of the core things of anarchism is it's not prescriptive. It's all about human freedom. And even like Kevin Carson, who endorses like occupancy and use in, um, mutualist political economy, great book, uh, it also just admits that there's going to be a panarchy of, you know, property relations. And I also think that your answer is very, within the realm of, of sterner egoism of just not letting these abstract things, these spooks define our real human, you know, unique relationships. So no, I don't think that's a disappointing answer at all. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, there you go. So still on the topic of property, I mentioned that you condemn private property at particularly because it, you know, allows for, you know, accumulation, it destroys the biosphere, all these things. Uh, but you go on specifically call for, ex- quote, expropriating private property into the hands of the masses under the power of the people to consume as they want. Uh, consumption in the sense used by Sterner means to exert power over a thing and take it into ourselves to dissolve it into the I that is myself. Uh, can you elaborate more on this um, how it relates to Sterner's thinking on consumption, how it might relate to his ideas on expropriation. And then is there any comparison to be made between this and Marx's vision of communism as, you know, being created by the seizing of the means of production? It was a, it was a lot in one, in one question. Yeah. I'll admit. Yeah. I'm just kind of, kind of reviewing it in my head here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, in regards to how that relates to kind of Sterner's philosophy. So to me, so Sterner talks about obviously, you know, alienation from our property and to use a very real world example, there's currently, as I'm sure you're familiar and a lot of people within the anarchist community are at least tangentially familiar at this point. Uh, there's the struggle currently going on in the Atlanta forest to resist Mm -hmm. the creation of, if I recall correctly, a kind of police academy as well as a filming studio. Cop City, right? They're calling it Cop City. Yeah, that's what they've been calling it, Cop City. Yeah. And so to kind of use that as kind of a very real-world example, these people who are 
defending the forest re- clearly have a very personal relationship to that forest in that it's a forest that's within the community that they live. And they feel that it's an important part of the ecological environment in relation to that community. So they have actively taken it upon themselves, seeing this forest as an extension of their community. Collectively, they went into the forest and using a myriad of different tactics, occupations, uh, you know, your typical street protests, things of that nature, and, and have continued to use that to resist, uh, police repression. Um, I'm currently not uh, at, at least speaking of this recording, I'm currently not up to date with what's currently going on within the Atlanta forest, but up to this point, that is what I'm familiar with in regards to, uh, resistance within that forest. But suffice it to say, that's kind of a very real world example of the idea of egos kind of coming together, you know, the people within this community collectively seeing this forest as a part of themselves and their collective community and actively taking action to protect it. Because, you know, if they were to try to position the state or something like that, that wouldn't be, you know, them using their own power to protect it. That would be them projecting onto a separate, you know, as Sterner would put it, a spook to take care of this issue for them. When I would support what they're doing now, which is taking direct action within their lives to protect something that they see as a part of themselves and their ecology. Mm-hmm. And um, so to kind of go back to that weird thing, I kind of stuck there in the end. <laughs> Is there any comparison between the seizing of the means of production, the seizing of private property in Marx's vision of communism? Yes and no. Um, I don't really consider myself a Marxist to any extent. Uh, I've read Marx. It's been a little while, though. But from what I recall correctly, um, I'm not a strict communist. And from what I gather, Marx basically technically was. Uh, so I'm very open about my ideas of what you know, anarchic economic situations might look like. So to me, what's important is people kind of seizing control of, you know, of their, you know, their local environment, their homes, their workplaces. And then it's kind of up to how those people relate to one another to decide what their society will look like. Because again, it kind of goes back to that idea of not being overly prescriptive and what one economic structure in one place might function well, might work, it might not work at all for somebody else and their uh, community. So mm-hmm. in regards to if it relates to Marx communism, my answer is maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Understandable. Um, I I had to shoehorn shoehorn Marx into here. I'm ki- I'm kind of the the guy who brings Marx into everything at the center, so <laughs> I had to find a way to do it. Um, but on the topic of the expropriation, you write that it would lead to quote a direct interaction with individuals and their communities in regard to their immediate biological surroundings allowing them to make rational decisions based within the knowledge and understanding that comes with localized living. There, you gave a great example earlier about the, the, the forest protectors as being an example of like direct action emerging from egos being concerned about the biosphere. But in sort of a more, you know, forward looking way, what does uh, localized and natural so- social organizing look like for you? What, what might a community that takes the social ecology of egoism seriously look like on a daily basis? So obviously the Atlanta forest was a great example of what that looks like in terms to terms of resistance. What I would more broadly say is I would say to start with understanding your local ecology. Mm-hmm. So what that basically means is just kind of, kind of Google searching 
your local area, kind of learning its plant life, its animal life, kind of how it functions. Because that's always a good place to start, because how can you know what's harming your environment if you're not familiar with your own environment? Now, I'm not saying people got to go out and basically get biology degrees in their local ecology. I'm not saying that. But having, you know, at least a basic understanding of how your local environment works is a good place to start. And from there, you can kind of, you know, find out, you know, what's a good way to garden here? What's what kind of animals need our support in the area? What's endangered? What's, you know, what what within our human society is causing damage to our ecology? And how can we kind of address that? So that's kind of the broad answer I would give to that is the kind of start by understanding your local area and how your environment functions, because then you can understand, you know, what's hurting it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but does it mean like you should get a cabin in the woods or you should, you should, you know, start, growing things you know on your own uh land like what are what does this look like for like if i wanted to go out and be an egoist social ecologist you know do, do, do you is it agrarian in nature or is it applicable everywhere i i, I don't you think know? it's any one sticky thing it's very broad because to me it's about how one associates with their local ecology. So it might look like, you know, growing food in your backyard, or it might look like, for example, in my, uh, uh, ecology and animals, uh, article, I, I believe I discussed this concept where it's like a tower that was used historically within the Middle East that pigeons could kind of, and birds could kind of go in and out. And they could kind of harvest for fertilizer. And for, I could see that possibly, possibly, I don't know personally, but it could possibly work in, in an area like a city. So, you know, that could possibly be used to support, you know, a local gardening effort within a city. And it's just kind of broad ideas like that. I'm not too, like I said, I'm not too overly prescriptive on what that would look like. I, I'm not too personally too fond of going off into a cabin in the woods. To me, it's more about, you know, where you're at, understanding your local ecology, mm -hmm. understanding what's hurting it, understanding, okay, so how do I approach my ecology and my local uh, society in such a way that I can make them more cooperative with one another? And because of the broadness of the biosphere, it's really hard to say one way or the other what that's going to look like because there's going to be a lot of different answers some of which might be drawn from you know the uh practices of you know indigenous peoples and their historical practices it might come from more modern concepts that we've found through scientific research i think it'll probably be more of a blend of different ideas from both our past our future and our present mm -hmm. Um, but beyond that, like I said, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very careful not to say what it's going to look like. And even in regards to like, I, I wouldn't even tell people go out and try to be an, uh, an egoist social ecologist. I would tell people to go out and be themselves. And if they find something useful in my piece or anything else I've written, go ahead and take take from it whatever that's that's good if you find something useful about it yeah that makes total sense uh and i appreciate you bearing with me while i try to drag that answer out of you <laughs> that's fine <laughs> uh but uh very interesting answers and that kind of concludes the the main part of my question so i want to ask is there anything we haven't touched upon that you want to speak about in this interview uh nothing off the top of my head that i can think of particularly all right. Well, no worries. What's the best way for listeners to follow you and your work if they found this compelling? Uh, I, you can find me uh, in two places. You can find me on Twitter at BlackStarBlog. And you can also find me on Mastodon, which I'm pulling up right now. 
you can find me at Blackstar Writings at Mastodon.social. All right. Fantastic. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on the Enrage. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me on. Of course.